right, we are ready to finish the multiple choice questions today. So we're gonna be doing 31 all the way to number 40. All right, and then we'll be finally done the multiple choice. So let's look at number 31. All right, so 31. Excellent. Key thing that's going on in this question is that they originally thought that the sample size was gonna be 2,500 people, but they don't have enough money, so they're only actually able to sample 1,500 people. All right, and we wanna figure out what happens because of that. All right, now there's kind of be two kind of things I'm thinking about with this question. I'll start with uh, the first way, which is if you look at answer choices A and B, it's talking about um, the variance of the sample and the variance of the population. This isn't going to affect the answers when you look at these different sample sizes. The key thing that's gonna happen when you change your sample size, it's going to affect the variance of the sampling distribution model. So the key thing is that A and B are not gonna be something that I focus on. I'm focusing on C through E for the variance of the sampling distribution model, okay? Now let me show you technically what would happen. So if you guys remember our standard deviation, let's do this, standard deviation of P hat. Do you remember the formula for that? It's close, P hat times times Q hat over N. And to get to Q hat, to, to get Q hat you do one minus Q hat, okay? So the way that I do this kind of problem is you can either make up numbers for P, right, for P hat. You can make up proportions if you want to use your calculator to see what happens. Or just ask yourself, you're trying to talk about the variance. Do you remember the relationship between variance and standard deviation? Say it again. I know that's what you should definitely know, but that's not actually helpful here. Bless you. Do you remember, Nicole? It comes before standard deviation because the variance, right? The variance is the standard deviation. Try that again. Is the standard deviation squared? Somebody said it. It's squared. Nice. Good job. So if you were to square both sides of what I just wrote. Right, so if I square my standard deviation, I have the variance equals, and what happens when you square a square root? It goes away, right? So we have p hat times q hat over n. Okay, now notice the sample size is in the denominator. And what's happening if we're going from 2,500 people to 1,500 people? What's happening to our sample size? It's decreasing. So if this number in the bottom gets smaller, do you know what happens to the variance? You divide by a smaller number. It gets bigger. Nice. So this means that the variance would increase. All right. So the answer is going to be C. Now here's another thing that I mentioned in our um, conversations in class is that I said if you wanted to decrease the variability of your sample, you need to do what? If you want to decrease the variability of your sample, you need to do one thing. Increase the sample size. So what's happening in this problem? They're going backwards. So if you're decreasing the sample size, you're actually going to increase the variability or the variance. So that's another way to think of this question. All right, so kind of two ways to attack it. All right, that's 31. All right, let's go to 32. And you know what, for this one, I'm gonna pull up the formula sheet because I think if you guys have your copies of the formula sheet, I'll pull it up for you. It's not what I was asking, but fair enough. I guess we're gonna find out, right? I just wanted to get to the formula sheet. Okay, so the formula sheet all right, and this problem talking about a 90% confidence interval. If you're using the formula sheets, let me zoom in a little bit, okay? It says confidence interval is statistic. So write that down. So this is a confidence interval. Statistic plus or minus 
the critical value times the standard deviation of the statistic. The formula sheet. Do you have your packets? Sad. Anyway, this is in the form of the sheet packet right here. I don't do this like when I'm taking this. I because I already know this, right? I already have this stuff memorized. I've been doing it for a decade. Yes, you have it. So what I'm trying to show you is if you know nothing, right, you can use your resources to get there, I think. All right? Now, this is helpful, but is it really that helpful? Not really, because it has no context, right? This is just like the most generic way to describe a confidence interval. Take your statistics or what you think it is, plus or minus the margin of error, okay? But ultimately, I wanna make this more specific to this problem. And it says to estimate the proportion. So how am I gonna change this where it says statistic? What am I gonna change that to say if I'm talking about a confidence interval for a proportion? Do you remember what our sample proportion symbol is that we use? No, that's sample mean, or well, that's population mean. We use Y bar for sample mean. Oh, it's P hat, nice, right? Proportion gotta be P. Plus or minus, do you remember what type of model we're using for proportions? Normal model, so what letter do we use with the normal model? No, what letter do we, that is true, that is true. I think what you're saying is, this, ah, you're talking about this letter, I don't wanna say like you're totally wrong, Jasmine, right? This would be like, if we're talking about like actually doing a normal model, I'm talking about like this normal model, All right? The Z, there we go, Jasmine, I love it. <laughs> All right, and then I'm gonna write down this standard error of P hat. Can I show you guys another part of the formula sheet? So Fatima, you got your formula sheet out? Yes? Do you see the standard deviation of the statistic for a sample proportion? Right, it's right here. Just know that I don't use one minus P, what do I use for one minus P? Q. I use Q, all right, Jasmine. Oh, yeah. All right, nice. <laughs> Why would you sit next to her, Fatima? Oh, just the vibes. Just the vibes, got it. Okay. Now let's see what we know. It says we have a random sample. So our sample size is 1,005 adults in the United States. It was found that 32% own an e-reader. Which of the following is the appropriate 90% confidence interval to estimate the proportion of all adults in the U.S. who own an e-reader? Does anyone own an e-reader? Like a Kindle? Yeah? One person. So lower than 32%. Well, we're not adults yet, so... Fair enough, some of you are. So when you do this, let's put some things in. Yeah, I don't, no. I like hard book, copy books, right? So I read like actual, actual books. Right, well, my dad loves the Kindle. All right. So what am I gonna put here at P hat? What is my proportion? 0. 0.32. 0. 0.32. Plus or minus, oh man, here we go, Jasmine. This could be three in a row for you. What is the Z star associated with 90% confidence? Oh my goodness. Wow. All right. And then in terms of the standard error, I put 0.32 times, what's one minus 0 0.32? Well, that's not a stats question, right? That's just subtraction. <laughs> Six, eight. Uh, over 1,005. 1, so we're looking for this answer choice. I was right. And you were right, Mabel. Now, when I do this, I'm just going to be honest with you, right? If you want to get a five on this, this question should be done in 20 seconds. Right? It should take you longer to read it than to answer it. Because the moment I read a 90% confidence interval, I'm crossing out A, I'm crossing out C, I'm crossing out D. Why? Because they have the wrong Z star. All right? And then, you know for me, I have this memorized for proportions. So I know it's not going to be B because they don't have the radical around all of it. 
right? Questions, everybody good? Use those test taking strategies to help you, even if you're you know, not sure about the statistics, you can still use your understanding of how to be successful in tests, because all of you guys, you're in this class, you've been successful in tests before. Okay, 33. I am gonna use some technology here, so if you don't have a calculator, make sure you get a calculator. It says, which of the following is a 95% confidence interval for the slope of the population regression line? So guys, I'm gonna literally do the same thing I just did. So I'm about, I'm gonna copy down that same thing from the form of the sheet, right? So confidence interval is equal to statistic plus or minus, they said critical value. Again, am I doing this for real like on the AP exam? No, this is wasting your time. I'm trying to teach you if you're having trouble with this times the standard deviation of the statistic. Okay, who knows what our statistic is gonna be for this one because this one is not proportions. It says a 95% confidence interval for the slope, for the slope. Do you guys remember what I used? Well, this is like the most recent unit. Do you know what symbol we used for the sample slope? It, no, not the circle one. That's sigma. That's standard deviation. No, not mu. Not you. The thingy. No. Uh, what am I asking? I'm asking what am I going to write down for the statistic? The last one was proportion. So the sample proportion is P hat. This one is B bar. Y bar, Jasmine? Jasmine, Y bar is the sample mean. Sample mean. This is the sample slope. Plus or minus? Let's see. What do you guys remember about um, when we did linear regression? Um, Inference testing, hypothesis testing, and intervals. Do you remember what model we used? I didn't want to say the full name. So linear regression something test. Uh, T test. So what model we're we using? We're using the T model. So this is T star. And if you're doing T star, do you remember what you must include? Mabel, you good? Bang. What do you have to include? Degrees of freedom. Times, all right, and if I go to the formula sheet, I don't think they actually do one for you here. No, they don't. But luckily, you've got computer output. All right, now, all of you, if you were successful on the most recent test, should have gotten this one right. All right, what is my sample slope from the output? Remember, what do you focus on? Do I focus on intercept? Do I focus on diameter? Diameter, not intercept. So focus on this row. So 1.054 plus or minus. I don't know yet. I have to go to technology to find T star. All right, times. And what's our standard error for that statistic? Excellent. All right, so you guys know that I'm gonna draw a curve. What level of confidence? says 95%. So how much is in each tail? Two and a half percent. Okay, before I go to the technology, let's find our degrees of freedom. Do you remember how to find the degrees of freedom for a linear regression T interval or T test? It's the same. I'm trying to find the degrees of freedom for a linear regression T interval or T test. It is, Nicole. And minus two, well done. How many trees are here? 31 felled trees, you guys see that? So the degrees of freedom is 29. All right, turn on your calculator. All right. Come on, folks. There we go. Now, if I'm trying to find T star, right? 
remember there's kind of two different ways the computer can help you or the calculator can help you. It can help you find the area under the curve if you know your critical value or if you know your Z score or T score, T value, or it can go backwards. If you tell it how much, just ignore what's on the screen. If you tell it how much is under the curve, how much area, it can tell you the critical value. We want to do the second one. So in essence, you're telling the computer that we need to go backwards. All right, so I'm just going to delete all this stuff. How do I clear it up? Okay, so I'm gonna to go to second. So click second and then VARS, oh, second VARS, which is distributions. Second VARS, which is distributions. So click that. Okay, we said what model are we using? The T model. And we don't know the T critical value. We don't know the T value. We know the area under the curve. So we have to go backwards. So the one you're looking for is inverse T, I'll repeat that, inverse T, which is number four. So click number four. Now, some of you might get this. If you don't get this, the first thing you're gonna type in is you're gonna type in the 0 0.025, okay? And then you're gonna type in the degrees of freedom, which we said was 29. Hold on. There we go. Good question. So if you go back to my curve that I sketched, it said it was a 95% confidence interval. All right. So that means on both tails, if you split the remaining 5% in half, then you get two and a half percent. All right. So what I'm going to do, essentially, essentially, Jasmine, what I'm telling the computer to do is to tell me the T value that's associated with two and a half percent of the data values below it. Okay. Everybody else good? Everybody good? If you don't have this, you would type in 0 0.025 first, comma, and then 29. Like this. Do you guys see this? See, if you don't have that, you type this in like that. So I'll wait till we're ready. And then hit enter. Is there a reason you're writing my name, Abel? Sorry? Is there a reason you're writing my name? Oh, um, no. Okay. <laughs> All right, so what is our T star? Two point, and it does say negative, Nicole. I don't really care about that, right? Because before this, it's gonna say plus or minus. So I just need to put the positive version, 2.045. Yes. No, she's she's Mrs. Bird. Are you okay with that? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I didn't didn't marry her for her name. <laughs> Who cares? Would you ever Huh? <laughs> maybe maybe someday I'll surprise her and change my name to Mr. Bird. That'd just be weird though, because then we already named some kids Brandrick. Some kids are Brandrick, some kids are Burn. So well, that's how it worked. It actually went dog burn. Dog was the first one. Burn. Then Henry Brandrick. Then Catherine Burn. Then Liam Brandrick. Then Andrew Burn. Yes, they alternate. They alternate. Do I need to go through them all? Okay, let's finish first, and then we can go through all the names. And any other important questions? So we actually now, if I could go back in time, I would have smashed up our names to this name. I thought this would be a cool name. The Vanderbirds. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, you can do whatever you want, Yashika. When you turn 18, are you 18? Uh, when you turn 18, you can go get your name changed. Yashika, 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 Yashika. That'd be pretty good. Okay, so let's go ahead and put in, I'm going to multiply my T star times the standard error, which is two for this. Times, what was it? 0 0.322? I forgot. Yeah. 
Okay, so there's my margin of error, 0 0.659, if you will, 0 0.659. And then to get the interval, I'm going to take my statistic, which is that sample slope, add the margin of error, and subtract the margin of error. So do both, and you'll get your answer. So 1.054 minus 0.659. And then do the same thing with addition. So the interval is approximately 0 0.395 to 1.713. All right, and I know that we did a lot of work there again. You we're taking way more time than we actually would to give you B. Notice, is my answer exactly the same as the answer? No, you're doing the one that's the closest. Yes. Interesting question. So because it wants me to find this confidence interval, I will need to find T star. And if I know the area under the curve, which I do, is 2.5% to the left of my T star, or I could have typed in 0 0.975. Right, that would give me my positive one, right? This one here. If I typed in the area to the left, which is 0 0.975, you can type that in too. They'll give you the positive version. So essentially, when you're trying to find a confidence interval and they want you to do it, you got to find a critical value. That's the inverse T, or if this was proportions, the inverse normal. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Well, are you talking about for the normal model? If they didn't say 90 or 95%, then you will have to do it, right? Because those are the ones I memorized. But if they said like 99%, I don't have that memorized. So I'd have to do it. Like you can, I just memorized those. Those are the most common. Like, so when we answered, was it 32? Whatever one we answered, that was E, that my melody was E. Exact, 1.645. That one, I'm like, yes, because they gave me 90%. Am I going to need to ask for the marker? I'm going to take the marker. I know. It's sad. I know. I'm the worst. Do you not like this? It's amazing. My artwork? It's so beautiful. All right. Let's go to 34. All right. Now in 34, we've got 80 people. 80 people who have been diagnosed as pre-diabetic because of high blood glucose levels. They volunteered to participate in a study to investigate whether the use of cinnamon can reduce blood glucose to a normal level. All right, because so we got 80 people. You guys picture 80 people? All right, so 40 are going to be randomly assigned to take a cinnamon tablet every day. All right, the other 40 are going to get the same thing, right? It looks the same, but it's not cinnamon. It's probably just a sugar pill, or actually, hopefully, in this case, nothing, right? A little nothing. That's called a placebo, okay? Now, the results showed that 14 people in the cinnamon group and 10 people in the placebo group had normal blood glucose levels, all right? We want to do the data. Oh, here we go. Do the data. Provide convincing statistical evidence. Pause. That means you got to run a test. The moment you read, do the data, provide convincing statistical evidence, you've got to run a test. Now, this is multiple choice, right? So do I need to do, like, all the stuff, parameters, hypotheses? No, right? You're just trying to do the mechanics, all right? And you know me. If I've got a calculator in my hand, I'm going to show you. I'm going to do very minimal writing, all right? The faster I do this, the faster I get to the next one. But to help us understand, the first thing I'm going to do is figure out which test we're going to run. It says that the proportion who will be classified as normal after one month of taking cinnamon is greater than the proportion who will be classified as normal after one month of not taking cinnamon, so the placebo. Key things there, proportions, so we got options here. It can be a one proportion z-test or a two proportion z-test, all right? And in this case, we're running 
two proportion because we've got those who took the cinnamon and those who took the placebo. All right, so this is a two proportion Z test. All right, so let's try to write down our hypotheses. Again, am I writing this down? No, but I wanna help you guys understand. All right, so what are we assuming about the proportion of those that took the cinnamon and those that took the not cinnamon, the placebo, and their blood glucose levels? Well, we wanna say first that the number of them, I guess I should say the proportion or the number out of 40 should be the same that we're able to get them, Jasmine, as you said, to a normal level. So I'm gonna say P for cinnamon, right? You guys go with that, P for cinnamon is equal to P for placebo. Is okay with that? PP? Sure, if you wanna say PP, that's fine, All right? I would tell my children, please don't. You could write that too. This would also work. Totally fine. Let's do the alternative. Okay. Now in the problem, it says, would the proportion of those that took the cinnamon be greater than, would be greater than. So I'm writing greater than for the cinnamon. Now let me write down some of the stuff they gave us. This is for the cinnamon. Oh man, I don't know how to spell cinnamon. I don't think that's right. It's right. Oh my God. Do you ever have those moments? I know, right? Where you're writing it and you're like, man, I don't think I've ever written down this word. Okay, so sample size is 40 for both. Everybody go with that. Yeah. How many, this letter X, is the number of successes. So how many that took cinnamon were able to get their blood glucose levels back to normal out of 40? 14, nice. How many that took the placebo? 10. Excellent. I think that's all we need. Does it say an alpha level? I mean, it says in the answer choices, but it doesn't tell us which one to do. So we're ready to go to the technology. Do you want me to do the other one uh, for you, um, Nicole? So P, P of C minus P subscript P would be greater than. Can you wait? I'm going to be done soon, right? Soon ish. And if not, you can go at 1220 when it's lunchtime. Great. Okay, so take your calculator out if you haven't already. Hit on. Make sure it's on. All right, I'm gonna go to stat, kind of like middle top where it says stat. So hit stat, like hit it, stat. Like middle top or middle, middle, stat, where it says S-T-A-T, stat. Next to the arrows. If you look up at the screen, then it's red on my screen. There you go. So hit stat, go over to tests. So over to tests. And which test do we say we're running? Excellent, which if you look up here, that's number six. So hit number six or scroll down to six and hit enter, two proportion Z test, all right? You can tell I already kind of done some of this. That's X subscript one, that's my cinnamon group. That was 14 out of 40. And then my placebo is 10 out of 40. If you haven't already, make sure that when you scroll here, I think yours will probably say this one, and not equal to, make sure you scroll over and hit enter on the greater than. And then down to calculate, yes. You might have to scroll up if it's like too far down, scroll up a little bit. All right, so you can see that our Z score is 0 0.976. And the key thing that I care about in this question, because it wants me to make a conclusion, is the p-value. And what is the p-value? Excellent. 0.165. This one here, where it says p, 0 0.165. So my p-value, 0.165. Now, guys, what alpha do we normally use? Excellent. And you notice in the, in the answer choices, they use 0 0.01 or 0 0.1. No matter which one you use, whether it alpha is 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 or 0 0.1, what is our p-value in relation to all three of those alphas? It's greater. So what do we do if our p-value is above our alpha? We fail to reject the null hypothesis. So is there convincing statistical evidence that those who are taking cinnamon are gonna be able to lower their blood glucose levels to a normal uh, level at a higher rate? The answer is no. 
So there is not convincing statistical evidence at any reasonable significance level. E. They're trying to get you to mess up by picking A. No conclusion can be made. Well, why were they volunteers, guys? Why did we want these people to volunteer? Because they're diagnosed as pre-diabetic. Do I want someone who's not pre-diagnosed? No. As, as, excuse me, diagnosed as pre-diabetic? No, right? It's the same thing like if you're going to like a clinical drug trial, right? Like my father who has Parkinson's, when he did his, do they want him because he's six foot two? No, no they want him because he's been diagnosed with an illness. What do you mean goes wrong? They die. Whoa. Well, hopefully that's the going wrong part is that you either had placebo. I'm sure if it's affecting like the fact that you might not live, they would stop. They would take you off. Do you get paid for that? Some of them you can, sure. But also you're just risking the chance of being paid or yeah, see, my father, he was hoping that he was getting the real thing and then hoping it would help him, right? That's kind of, huh? They stopped the control trial. They ran out of funding. Sad. It's okay. No worries. 35. Ready? All right. So this is talking about running a test to find the relationship between two, uh, excuse me, two quantitative variables. So this is a linear regression t-test. Now this problem is not asking you to run it, right? It's asking you essentially, do you remember any of the assumptions slash conditions that we went over? And if you don't, it's okay, right? This is one of those questions where if you're getting this, you're getting a four or a five, all right? This is a tough question, all right? Now one of the conditions, all right, that we're looking at, all right, is that the variance between your residuals has to be equal, right? So look at the residuals plot. Do you see it kind of looks like a fan pattern? Let me show you where it's like starts here and then gets like, it increases in variance as you go. Yeah, do you see that? See how it's kind of doing that? So here it's really close and then it goes like that, right? So this would be that instance where it's failing to meet that condition, all right? So the idea here is that you're supposed to have equal variance throughout your residuals, all right? That's not happening. You're gonna so when you look at this for question or answer choice E, where it says the variance of the response variable is constant for all values of the explanatory variable, that is what we're failing to see in the residuals plot. So if you see a fan pattern when you're trying to run this test, that's an issue. Let's back it up. Let's back it up before you'd ever heard, whoo, nice catch, before you'd ever heard these four words together, all right, or three words with a letter. Before you'd ever heard linear regression t-test, we talked about linear regression. What are you hoping to see in the residual spot? A cloud. a cloud. Is this a cloud? No, it's showing a pattern. So if you back this up to the first semester, this would tell you that, is it appropriate to use your linear model? No, it's not appropriate to use your linear model. So just be careful. They might ask you a question with residuals in that regard. Okay. So remember when you run your linear regression, you're hoping to see no pattern slash a cloud in the residual spot. 36. All right. Let's see, I think we can get this. So we have a test. All right. And they're saying that they think right now that 38 is their best idea. And they want to see if it's actually not equal to 38 for the population mean. All right. They gave us a p value. All right. With a sample mean. They didn't give us a standard deviation. So I can't actually tell you what the t score is. Let's just make it up. Let's say t is equal to 2.3. Now, does anyone see why I'm shading both tails? Why am I shading both tails? Because the hypothesis is not equal. The not equal to part. So because the alternative is not equal to, this is what we call a two-tailed test. So we're shading in both tails. Okay. Now, the problem says, what if instead of saying it's not equal to, they changed it, I'll do another sketch, All right? So they changed it, but now it says that it's less than. 
Which tail do I care about if I'm doing less than? Nice, look at you. So now I'm only shading down here, right? So what happens to the P value if originally it was a two tail test and now I'm changing it to be a one tail test? You can see what happens? So this was the original, there's two of them. Now there's one of them. So what happens to the p-value? What should you do to the p-value? Cut it in half. Right. Cut it in half. So which answer choice is showing you half of that original p-value, which is e? I feel like it's been e a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't go with that, but sure. The key thing about that was, do you understand the difference between two tail tests and one tail test? If you don't, hopefully now you do. 37. All right. This is going to be one of those times where I'm going to say, or I'm going to want you to say variance is add, but we're not going to do it. I know. I know, right? Oh, God. All right. Here's why they're tricking you. This is about track students, and they are going before training, they tell us their mean running time with a standard deviation. Then after completing a training program, they give us some new information. The reason I can't do variances add is this, guys. When you do variances add, that's assuming that your two variables are independent, right? It's assuming that your two variables are independent. So if we're looking at our data, and before the training process, it's these students, and after the training process, it's the same students, are those actually independents? No, it's the same kids, right? It's the same people running. So this is not independent. So the key thing I want you to know here is that because it's not independent, we can't do variances add. So not A and not B, because they're not independent. We can still subtract their average times. So it looks like it, this is X minus Y, right? So the mean for X was, what was the mean for before? 402, that's for X. And the mean for Y is 368. So what happens when you subtract those? What do you get when you do 402 minus 368? You get 34, right? You get 34. So the key thing here is, you're gonna see the answer choice is D. They're not independent. You can still find the mean, that's okay. Even if they're not independent, you can still subtract them or add them, whatever it tells you to do. But the standard deviation cannot be determined because in order to use variances add, they must be independent of each other and they're not. All right, so that's one of those like rare, very rare cases that you won't be using variances add. When they're not independent. All right, they have to be independent. All right, we got three more guys, we're almost there. All right. All right. We're being asked to find just the standard error of a confidence interval for a difference between proportions. So I'm going to go straight to the form of the sheet. All right. Here's my form of the sheet. I have to zoom out a little bit so you can see it. Come on. Okay. Do you see it at the bottom here? Nope. Almost there. There it is. Right here. See the difference in sample proportions for the standard deviation? So I'm using this formula here. All right, you know that I'm not gonna write one minus those letter P's, I'm gonna write Q. <coughs> <coughs> <Ooh. coughs> Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna write P hat one, times Q hat one. All right, so let's do the first sample. And it looks like the first sample are those people who are not scientists. So how many were sampled who are not scientists? Um, 2, nice. Okay. How many were sampled that were scientists? Okay. That doesn't really help us answer it, right? I mean, we know it's not B, because that's a subtraction. 
All right, we know it's not E. It doesn't have the radical over all of them. Okay? Now, it says of those who were not scientists, 37% responded yes. So that's my P hat. And then it says for the scientists, 88% responded yes. So using my understanding of subtracting that from one, I get, what is that? 0 0.63 and 0 0.12. So you should find the answer. It's not E. Looks like it's A. I guess we could have gotten it because I never have told you guys to do it separately. Look at that. We didn't have to do any of that work. Amazing. So it's not E every time. I know, sad. All right, two more. All right. Now, when we actually did this question uh, in the review from our chi-squared test, our, our last unit test. And do you guys remember how to find the chi-squared component? Or you do that summation symbol, right? It's me, my ridiculous noise. Observe. Excellent. Over. Expect it. Now, this is one of those. I'm going to go to the formula sheet. All right, you're going to be very happy. Wait, maybe not. There it was. You see it right at the end? Ah, right here at the end. Right there. You see it? So they give you that one, right? But in my head, right, I'm saying, ah. Remember? Remember what Marco likes to say? All right. So this one is asking about just men who selected business networking as the most important factor. Okay. So for this one, how many actually did we see that are men that said business networking is their main factor for using social media? 45. Do you remember how to find the expected value? This is like the clunky way. Row total times column total divided by the grand total. But I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna show you guys some technology here. All right, so take your calculator out, open it, turn it on. Let me show you how to do something with chi-squared. All right, so the first thing, this is why, one of the reasons that I this technology, is that in order to do chi-squared, you've got to create a matrix. All right, you ready? All right, so do you guys see where it says matrix? It's in blue where it says x to the negative first power, kind of like middle left. So hit second, x to the negative first power, which is second matrix, all right? And then go over to edit. Make sure it's second matrix and go over to edit. Second matrix. It's kind of like middle left, uh, nickel. Second matrix, awesome. And then all the way over to edit. Now you probably won't have anything in matrix A, so go ahead and just hit number one or enter on matrix A. I've already typed it all in, but the first thing you do is to do the rows and columns. You guys see the rows and columns? So it's two rows and five columns. And then you should be able to, once you type in two and then enter and then five, you should be able to type all this in. So I'll give you a moment to type this in. All right, so we've got them all typed in. Now what I want you to do is I want you to hit stat. Okay, so stat, because we're gonna go run a test. So hit stat and then over to test. And we're gonna run a chi-squared test. So go down. Here are the two options for chi-squared. You've got chi-squared test or chi-squared goodness of fit test. Do you remember what we call this table? Do you remember what we call this table? A two-way table or a contingency table. If you guys see a two-way table, it is not goodness of fit. I repeat, if you see a two-way table, it is not goodness of fit. So the one you want to choose is numbers or <laughs> number letter C, chi-squared test letter C. So go to C and hit enter. Now I'm telling it I typed in my observed values A. I wanted to put the expected values in B. So I'm going to go down to calculate. Now this is actually running the test. If you notice that p-value is 0 
or 0 0.2, I guess, 0 0.00002. That's tiny, right? So is there enough evidence to reject? Yes, but that's not actually what I want to do here. I want you to then go back to matrix. So second matrix, second matrix, and you see, don't go over to edit, just go down, go over down to B, and hit enter. Do you guys have something in B now? Yep. Hit enter on B, hit enter again. And you know what these numbers are? These are the expected values. So the one I care about is the 30, that first row, second to last column. So that's a long way to find the expected value. You do the math, this is 15 squared divided by 30, that's 225 divided by 30, which is 7.5. This is one of those questions where the technology, I think, makes it more challenging. So I personally, if I'm doing this to Cole, I'm doing row total times column total divided by grand total. I think that's faster for me. Because I just like, why am I making a matrix to do this? Like, that's absurd. All right. Let's do 40, then we'll be done. This question is asking about the correct interpretation of a confidence interval. There's a lot going on here, all right? One thing that I've had you guys think about was if you look at the level of confidence, in this case, it says 95%, all right? One thing I say a lot is if that if I were to run 100 samples and get 100 different confidence intervals, then I would say that 95 of those 100 would capture the true proportion, all right, or the true population mean, whatever it is, all right? And this one I think is about means, okay? Now that looks like C, right? Of all the samples, 95% of them will have a mean. But the key thing that they're messing up here is that it's not that 95% of them will have a mean between these, right? This is just from a sample is that 95% of them will capture the true population mean. So it's not C. They're trying to mess that up. <laughs> the ones that I thought sounded the, the most accurate were D and E. I am 95% confident that the mean number of hours worked per week in the sample is between. So really, they're trying to steer you to D and E. Okay, and I, if you remember the, all the times we've ever written this, I've never said in the sample. I've never once had you guys write that. So if you pick D, I'm sorry. It's E. You got it right? Good for you, Wendy. Nice. You were close. If you pick D, you were close. Yes, we're about to go to lunch.